way below the level of poverty uh, in uh, <clears throat> reservations that have been given to them by the government in, in, uh, out in Big Cypress and there in uh, Hollywood. The one in Hollywood they called the big city. And um, uh, so he, someone, somewhere down the line he figured out what sovereignty meant. Because from the very day that they were, they were incorporated as an Indian tribe in 1957, they were a sovereign nation. But most Indian tribes never took advantage of their sovereignty. And he figured, well, uh, we don't have to do what the state tells us to do. We're, we're different. And so he, somebody came to him. Uh, he, he worked for a while in different uh, government jobs. And then he ran for the chief, ran for chairman. Usually in Indian tribes, even to this day, the chairman, they usually have a, 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 a government that has a, a council and a board of directors. The president of the board of directors, which is what Joe Dan Osceola was, he was the president when he came to Seminole that time. He was the youngest person ever to be president of an Indian tribe when he came here. And that was when he first, first was in office. And uh, James, but the chairman they usually call chief, you know, but, he, but his correct title is chairman. And, uh, chairman of the council. And he, uh, he ran uh, against a, uh, a, a, a chief that had been in there for quite some time named Howard Tommy, and he won. And uh, I remember talking to Bobby Henry, that's a bobblehead up there, Bobby Henry, the, uh, the medicine man, but, but the story was is that even when James Billy was a little kid, uh, he, all the people knew he was special. Uh, I talked to Sonny Billy, who was also a medicine man, he told me the same thing, they felt like there was something special about him. Wherever he went, they could tell that he was going to be something. It could have been his brash attitude. Even as a kid, he's very brash, not afraid of anything, you know. Um, but whatever it was, he won that election. And the first thing he did uh, is he started investigating bingo. High stakes bingo. The only people allowed to do high stakes bingo at that time in Florida were... were uh, a charity such as the Catholic Church would have bingo night. They would even have casino night, and it was okay. And they had, of course, they were highly regulated. They were not had to go to a nonprofit. There were certain levels on how much could be won and, and bet and that sort of thing. So, um, are we ready to do the movie? Yeah. I, well, pictures. Oh, those are the pictures. I think so. Oh, okay. Well, we can we can. Uh, how would how would I show them though? Um, it, there's a picture right there, and I will move forward every time you want me to. What, start at the beginning. This was the first picture. Um, I can back up to... Yeah, there are other folders. Uh, there's one called... No, no, right down here where it says Final Lost Photos of the Seminole Tribe. Oh, okay. Final Lost Photos. Okay. That's the... Well, at any rate, he, he did. He went and he fought a battle with the uh, sheriff of uh, Broward County. It was a stage battle, as I found out later. Bob, Bob Butterworth, who later on became the Attorney General of Florida. And I've talked to Bob about it. They, Bob came uh, to, you know, I thought, I thought they were enemies, Bob Butterworth and James Billy, because they went into a Supreme Court fight. And, uh, and James Billy won, and he was allowed to have the, uh, the high-stakes bingo that eventually transferred into becoming a ma major casino. So now he's got a $87 billion a year uh, casino, Indian country casino industry out there, but uh, but Butterworth had come to him and, and they, they figured out it's, you've got to go through a challenge, and so he made like he was mad and he was going to burst in there and grab all their machines, and uh, and they had this uh, major battle and it went right through the court system and and uh, Butterworth versus Seminole Tribe of Florida is a famous famous case that everybody studies in law school. The lost photos, you, you, if you, if you uh, go ahead to uh, 2001, James Billy had been reelected like five times. And, uh, oh, okay, okay, great. And um, he uh, uh, suddenly one day he was, the, the other guys in the council who were at the, by this time, see, when I first went to work for him in 1984, they were, they were not even a $1 million a year company. And when I left in 2001, the first time, they were uh, like a $3 billion a year company. So I was there. These pictures represent them, the change from, from, from being 
practically nothing. You know, they, there's uh, right around, uh, at this point, around 4,000 uh, 4, Seminoles. That's all there are. When I got there, it was probably around 3,000. But uh, the night that we were the council, that not only did they fire him, uh, impeached him, they fired all the people on the newspaper staff, all the white people. In fact, all the white people in the tribe were fired. 80 or 90 of them that were employed by the tribe. And uh, they called me up, and I went to uh, put a picture up there. <laughs> I went to, uh, I got in my van. I was up here in St. Petersburg where I lived, and I went all the way down to Hollywood and went into the, to the, to the office to get my stuff. It was late at night, and I noticed uh, about 10 or 12 trash cans big old trash cans, big deep ones that were lined up right outside the door there. That, uh, the way they, that's how they left the trash out for the, the trash man when he came in the morning on each floor. of the. It's a five-story building. And um, something caught my eye because there was trash on each, all of it. And I looked in, I moved the trash away, and there were photographs. They, they, someone had gone in there and took every single photograph that had been taken in all those years it's from the time James Billy started up until, until that day and threw them away. Photographs, slides, and negatives. And uh, I got a dolly out of the storeroom there, and I just, as fast as I could, I made <laughs> 12 or 15, I don't remember how many times, I went up and down the elevator to, to my van, I just took those things and threw them in there and went back up. I had a key to get in the building uh, it hadn't been turned off, I guess. And uh, then I went, I got in the van, and I, I took off from Hollywood, I went through the back roads, I knew I was on a camera. I, I thought, well, they're going to come get me. Seven o'clock in the morning, banging on my door. I look out, and it's a whole bunch of Seminole policemen. So I called the St. Pete cops. I said, hey, get, have these guys out of here. And they, they said, well, they say you stole a bunch of stuff. I said, come on in my house and look. They went and looked, and of course, it was all in my van out there. Didn't <laughs> and, um, and they took off, and I called Jim Billy and, and uh, another guy named Billy Cypress, who was the, the, uh, the curator of the museum two of my closest friends, and they said, don't ever bring those things back. Uh, they'll, they'll put them in a storage or something. Don't bring them back until, until I'm able to get back into office. So for 11 years, I hid those things out in different storage areas, and lived with them and everything else. And then when he finally came back into office in 2010, he hired me, and that was the first thing we did. We went and got a grant from the Department of the Interior, a preservation grant, to pay. And we had them all, all those pictures. It turned out to be 166,000 images. Um, and they were, um, um, we took them and they were digitized. We had put them all on digital. They're saved now. You know, it's just, I, I would have been, I would have been mortified if those things had been thrown away. It's just, when you see these pictures, you can see what it could have been. This is the kind of access that I have because that's, that's the chief, actually, he's, that's where he lived. In the, he had a house in Big Cypress and he had another one in uh, Fort Lauderdale, uh, which is, or Hollywood, which is where the, um, the headquarters were. And of course, uh, uh, Jim Billy was an alligator wrestler. That's in the name of the movie. If we, we, I don't think we'll be able to see it tonight, but we'll, we'll bring it one other day. It's called Wrestling Alligators, and uh, um, he was actively doing it um, uh, for this reason. He was one of the one of the uh, that's that's his uh, his kitchen, his uh, the cook fire and everything where he lived down in Big Cypress. Does, you can't see it here, but he had a little chicky over to the side that was air conditioned when he went, went to sleep at night. <laughs> it's hot out there, you know. But um, but he was a chief, so he had an air conditioned chicky. Um, like I said, he's he's his family, his people, his age. Were, after his age, his kids were all born in in hospitals and uh, yeah. He and he was a master chicky. He is as still to this day a master chicky builder who built all types of chiquis. He would build them to make them look like a, like a bird. That's like a lean-to. He built, uh, he built chiquis all over the place. He, I can't tell you how many times he landed in a helicopter in the back of an of a, of a elementary school somewhere where he had met a teacher at some function, and she'd give him the address, and he'd come in there and he'd build a little Indian village in their backyard, just free of charge, just go in there and do that. All the, he's, he built all the chiquis up at the Florida Folk Festival with the Stephen Foster uh, park up there. If you ever go to that park up in White Springs, in the middle of it, it's a very authentically done. All the chickies placed where they were supposed to be, and uh, he uh, he built uh, the chickies at Eckerd College that they have out there by the by the waterfront. And, um, 
it was one of the things we did all the time. Was he had he had a crew? They would go by plane, and he would we would fly in a, in a hill. He was a helicopter pilot too. And uh, no, I think he was a he was a paratrooper in Vietnam. I don't know what he he learned to fly a helicopter when he, after he got back here. That that was his family when I first met him. You know, and uh, his uh, uh, three little girls there, and his wife and him, and, uh, uh, and his dog named Bingo. <laughs> and of course, that's the Florida Folk Festival. Uh, He's playing a guitar that John Anderson gave him, a famous country singer. He was down and out on his luck, and he spent a week in, uh, well, a couple weeks actually, out in Big Cypress, camping in the woods out there. And they had a fire. We'd go out there at night, and everybody had their guitars and play and everything. And he ended up writing the song Seminole Wind while he was out there. And uh, so he gave him that guitar as a token of his gratitude, but that, that changed his career around, and now it's one of the most famous songs in country music. This is the, he, what happened was a, uh, the Seminole Museum, it's supposed to be A-T-A-H, A-T-A, Thiki, but the, uh, the, for some reason they misspelled it on every piece of paperwork, all the, the it, it, and, he, and he never said a word about it, because it had to have passed his desk a million times, except the very day of the dedication, he, he suddenly did, Figured that out and went up there and had him change the to the mortification of the uh, the uh, museum director and everybody else. Of course, fishing out in the swamp and the cypress domes. That's Joanne Shenandoah, famous Indian uh, uh, singer, and she's holding up his finger that he got bit off by an alligator, and he kept it. People used to say, "Oh man, I heard you lost your finger." He goes, "No, I didn't lose it. It's right here." <laughs> And he, uh, th when he, when he got the finger bit off, there were a group of Navajo uh, code talkers. I think you know what they were. They were the ones that uh, did the language, uh, their language, so that the other side couldn't tell what was going on. And, and uh, uh, they were there, older guys. They were, they were leaning at the alligator pit. And it was filmed and everything. In fact, the film got uh, grabbed by one of these tabloid television shows. Every once in a while, it shows up even now, you know. They stood up like that, looking at his finger, put it under his arm, and just walked off and they were all clapping they thought it was part of the show <laughs> but they went back and got uh, got the finger and they couldn't reattach it so most of the alligator I'll be honest with you most of the alligator wrestlers have lost a finger and he was always proud of the fact that he had never lost it so this guy that's uh, yeah he's holding up this uh hand of a guy. That th this, is, this is the uh, Secretary of the Interior signing the Immokalee Reservation into a uh, uh, federal trust. And Immokalee became a, a reservation, yeah. He's holding up his hand, the other guy behind him's hand is obviously missing a finger. He's a cattleman. A lot of the Seminoles out there in Big Cypress are cattlemen. They, the, uh, uh, they own the cattle and the tribe itself owns all the bulls. And that's how that's how they operate. And, they, and now to, nowadays they sell them by video, uh, just like all the. They have one of the largest cattle operations in Florida. I mean, the Indians of Florida were the very first cowboys. There were there were cows in Florida before they were anywhere else. Cows and horses. They didn't have any horses out west. These uh, the Spanish brought them up, brought them, in, and when they left Florida in a, in a in a rush, they left cows and horses. And so Seminoles were the first uh, cowboys. This is the Elvis of the Arctic, we, and a scary guy, never went out of character. He always was, oh, hello there, you know, yeah. talking like that, you know. And, but we went up to a, a music festival up, up uh, in Inuvik territory, in Inuvik Indians, uh, and uh, James Billy was hired, his band was hired to be stars at this uh, big show, and they were, wanted a picture with Elvis. So. And that's Deadwood, um, the Deadwood, I guess, South Dakota, is it? And, uh, uh, that they have every year. He was, and his album was nominated for a, a, a Grammy that year. It didn't win, but uh, that is what it looks like at the, Sec at the Department of the Interior in Washington. That's what the, people don't realize that the U.S., United States Department of the Interior is almost 80, between 80 and 89, 80 and 90 percent 
Indian Affairs. The other 10% is, you know, the Bureau of Land Claims and, uh, you know, the, um, uh, the, 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 you know, the National Park Service. But the, the whole building is, is Indian Affairs, you know. And this is uh, the band Fish. The guy with the blue guy at the... Uh, the blue shirt with the big hair, that's that's the guy from Fish. And then James Billy, Rayford Stark, his guitar player, and John McEwen from the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band. And this was at the uh, New Year's Eve uh, when 1999 turned into 2000. That New Year's Eve, they had a Fish concert. Um, we worked it out yeah, in, in, on the Big Cypress Seminole Indian Reservation and attracted over 100,000 people. It was the largest, one of the largest concerts ever at that time in the United States. And they brought the, the chief up to uh, to play with them on a couple songs. This is the grand opening of the world's largest bingo hall, Big Cypress Bingo. It was a big, giant, almost uh, you, you could have fit several gigantic uh, airplanes in that in that building. That building still exists to this day out at the Big Cypress Reservation. But they filled it up, and there were buses, so many buses that it filled up uh, Alligator Alley from one end to the other, and all the way up Snake Road to the uh, reservation. And they gave away. Uh, a uh, million dollars on on one game in there. Of course, it's sunset on the Big Cypress. This I think is when uh, Hurricane um, Wilma came right over the reservation, and the eye of the hurricane went directly over where we we were stuck out there. We didn't we we couldn't leave. We didn't know where where it was going to go, and the eye came directly over the. Uh, uh, Indian Reservation. I was out at a place called Billy Swamp Safari out in Big Cypress, which is a tourist attraction that they that they operate out there. And uh, all of a sudden, the alligators are sticking their heads up out of the out of the pit and, and, and making bay, almost baying. And the the water buffalo that were out in the thing started running into where the people were. All the animals were acting weird, and, and it was uh, totally still. And it was right, right through the eye of the, of the storm. I have a bunch of pictures like this where you can see the. This is your. This is a Mockley Big Cypress Outback. A lot of the medicine people would go to this area of uh, Florida to pick up the medicine that they used. Um, the Seminole tribe put on powwows during those years uh, all over the country: Nashville, Atlanta during the Olympics. Um, did one right here in uh, at Vinoy Park in uh, St. Petersburg, and uh, this here is uh, a Pequot Indian. They, I call this picture the Blue Indian. But actually, I was like on the ground shooting at these people as they were dancing by me. That was that's not really a posed picture, but you know I was fortunate to have access that not a lot of people would have because of my role there. That's this is another of the uh, powwow pictures. This is uh, Tommy Jumper on the left. Did not speak any English, and Miko Billy, Jim James Billy's son, Miko. <coughs> On the right there, and this is at this uh, at the Smallwood store down in Chukaluski. <clears throat> Smallwood store, which was one thing that did not blow down and stood up and only lost a couple of uh, shingles during Irma, even though it came in right on it. It's unbelievable, and um, it uh, it's a sacred place to the Indians because they when they when they came out of the woods and the swamps in the in the 1800s, they didn't know in the late 1800s they did not know if the war was over or not. Because when the army came after them, they would do you know they would either kill them or they would grab them and they took them all the way to St. Petersburg and put them in a prison right out at Egmont Key. When you go over the Skyway Bridge, look over to the right, and you'll see a light fl flash every once in a while. That's the Egmont Key Lighthouse, and on that they had a prison on there. And once they had about 50 or 60 of them, they would send a steamboat down to uh, uh, Egmont Key and herd them on the steamboat, and the steamboat would take them up to all the way up the Gulf, up the Mississippi River, and then they would join the Cherokee and the Choctaw that were walking to Oklahoma. So the, the Seminoles, has a vo it was a voyage of tears. And um, uh, that's why uh, they, were, they were very much supported the Egmont Key Preservation, Egmont Key Alliance. I'm still a member of the Egmont Key Alliance trying to save that island. It's, it's getting eroded and... and uh, there are there are several Indians buried on there, but then there's a whole bunch of them that were just thrown in a in a mass grave, you know. 
Billy Bowlegs, his name is Billy Bowlegs, was, was that Egmont Key. This is uh, Stephen Bowers, one of the Seminoles, and that's the, that's the Smallwood store behind him there. This is uh, marching in the uh, inauguration for Lawton Childs, I believe. Uh, the Seminoles went up there. They, they, every year that there was a new, when I was working for them, whenever there was a new governor, they did that. They would march, uh, march with their horses in the parade with the Seminole flags. And of course, the uh, the great, beautiful patchwork. Uh, the, people don't realize that patchwork was not a, 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 you know, it was not something that the Seminoles, it was not a traditional art of the Seminoles. It came along when, when sewing machines came along. And um, there's a, uh, uh, the story was is that there was a, a wagon train of some sort that uh, was up near uh, St. Augustine that was attacked by, by Seminoles during the Seminole War because they figured they, were, they looked to them, for some reason they thought there was munitions you know, and rifles and stuff on this wagon train. And when they, when they got, got, got the stuff out and everything opened it up, it was actually an Elizabethan theater troupe. And they were all costumes. And that's where they got the idea they have turbans, the Indian. The Seminoles started wearing the stuff that they found in there. They liked the colors. That's a true story. And uh, um, I have a painting on my wall that Guy Labrie did of that scene. Of they're, they're looking in and holding the stuff up, you know. And then they, it, that became a thing with them. And uh, I see you have a couple here. But each one of those, now those, those patchworks there are modern patchworks. But there are, there's like 12 or 15 Man on a horse, fire, you know, that, that, that symbolize certain things, you know. These are uh, some of the Seminole people. people and there's, uh, that's the Smallwood store, and those are four, four men who participated. They have clothing contests. It's a big thing with the Indians, even to this day. They'll come out, they're different ages, they dress up, they have baby contests, and they, uh, they play stickball, and they love... Uh, Horseshoes and stuff like that at, at their big parties. They have a reservation now that's being uh, it's in it's in the works in Lakeland uh, to replace really what they lost when they built the uh, the Hard Rock on the Tampa reservation. That Hard Rock takes up almost the whole footprint of the original reservation. The people that, the people that were there now live in homes uh, that the tribe bought for them and around that area in Brandon and in uh, uh, Eastern Hillsborough County. Uh, but they, they, that property is out there, and they have a chickie out there that has uh, um, uh, solar panels on it for power. Because until it becomes a reservation, they can't do any, uh, you know, plumbing or or anything like that until until it's a uh, reservation. So they're st still waiting any day for that to happen. Oops. Okay, that's uh, I was going to say that's that's Mitchell Cypress, Dorothy, um, sitting there, and he uh, these are a couple of the cattlemen taking a break. That's Minnie Doctor, famous doll maker. I believe she's still alive to this day, but she's just known all around the world for making Seminole dolls. And the sad thing is there's, very, there's practically nobody that I know of now that make them. I know that Bobby Henry, the medicine man, his family are, are in Tampa. He has, a, he has a store at the Hard Rock called The Rainmaker, and uh, you, can, you can buy them in there. But when I first worked for the Seminole tribe, you could buy one of those little dolls for 10 bucks. Now they're like $80. They're so rare now. They're made out of corn husk. And every, uh, when Betty Mae Jumper used to have a, she had a, a business. She had one lady that made the corn husk, one lady that made the little dresses, one lady that made the eyes, and one lady that put it all together. They had a whole factory thing going there, you know. That's, uh, that was an interesting photo way back then. It's, you know, a chick E, a, a guy working on a computer that went under a chick E. <laughs> that was like the very first, uh, um, piece of a personal computer. I mean, right there, you know, a laptop. That, that's what they looked like when it first came out. My heroes have always killed cowboys. That's Joe, Joe Dawn, I see. He, he's a character. And of course, these are the cattle pictures. This is Jimmy uh, O'Toole. Osceola, he was a tailor. And the finest, his, his jackets, if, he, if it was a Jimmy O'Toole jacket, he had the finest one made. He was the, the greatest of the, uh, of the jacket makers. 
John Henry Billy, last of the canoe makers. His canoes are in museums all over this state. In fact, that's the day I met Donald Trump. Uh, he was out at his he was out at his house. He lived just south of the Big Cypress Reservation, middle of nowhere, right off of Snake Road that comes up from Alligator Alley. And uh, I saw a big giant limo parked there when I was, I was coming in there one day. So I stopped to see who it was, and it was Donald Trump. And he stopped to see uh, Henry John, and Henry John was uh, showing him how he builds uh, canoes and everything. And he wanted to, uh, uh, he was looking for the chief, you know. I said, well, the chief isn't here, but I can call him up. And I called him up, and the next thing you know, the chief, all the, all the leaders flew in to, to Big Cypress, and they, they got a big old meal of all kinds of different meat, like rattlesnake, squirrel, deer, all the different type of meats that they had out there. And, uh, and they had a dinner, and, and Trump was at the, uh, the table, basically trying to convince them that he wanted to build their casino. <laughs> this is in the early days before it was even a serious thing. This was also right during the same time that he had stood up at Congress and had, uh, had said that uh, something about these Indians, they don't even look like Indians. How come they get, how come they, uh, they get all these advantages? And they, don't, they don't even look like Indians because he was talking about the Pequots that are very light-skinned, you know, that were, that were applying to be the, the first tribe to have a casino, you know. So up right outside of New York, where he wanted, where he wanted, that thought it was his territory. That that's where he's getting his award, the, the uh, Florida Folk Heritage Award. And yeah, you know, he's he's showing how he carves a canoe, but he that's a lost art, and I'll tell you they. Uh, James Billy told me well, he, he's actually formed a corporation called the Chief Jim Billy Foundation dedicated to the preservation of Seminole culture and language. Practically nobody speaks the language and all these, these art uh, here are going out. You know, Fred Smith, president of the Seminole tribe for about 30 years. He's, we we're inside an old barn that he brought me to one day. He, he used to, he used to uh, herd his cattle in a Volkswagen honking his horn and they would all follow that Volkswagen wherever he went and he showed me this barn it was all covered with kudzu he gave me a machete he got a machete we cut through it and opened up and we walked in I go what is this place during the um, the CCC Civilian Conservation Corps um, in the early days of, even before the when the Seminoles were out there before they were even incorporated as a tribe they built barns for Indians and uh this was the last red barn left. They were all red. They all had the same architecture. And all this history is at the, the museum in Highlands Hammock State Park, which is the, all the, the uh, CCC files nationwide are in that, in that museum there at uh, Sebring at Highland Hammock State Park. And so what this, what this led to another, uh, another, years and years later, we ended up getting that red barn renovated. And it's on the National historic register now. You should see it now. It's beautiful. That's what it look, kind of looked like. But they gave them a barn so they could put a, a place to give their horses and then they brought over cattle um, and gave them cattle too they, uh, from, uh, uh, from out west. They figured the Indians can, maybe we can get them to be cattlemen. Maybe they can do that for a living to help themselves, you know. Here's Thomas Storm. He was a an alligator wrestler. He would. Do, he used to, he's the guy who used to dive in and do the deep water wrestling and come up with a big, most big giant alligator snapping turtles and he's snapping right up right near his head. You know, quite a showman. I went with him and his. He's part of the Bobby Henry family. I took them to Singapore one year for a couple of weeks, and every day they did a demonstration in the town square, right in the middle of the town. I'm a storm. There he is. He's pulling all those things up. Can you imagine diving in the water and picking that up and bringing it up? I mean, and uh, there was a lady that showed up one day, and and they hired her to make bronze heads of all the leadership. So there's blonde, even even the even the medicine people and everything. She came there and poured you know the stuff on there. And, uh, her name was Camille Baumgartner. She was a Playboy bunny way back in the 50s and later in life she became became an artist she lived in Everglades City 
This is a picture I took uh, of a Florida Panther. Uh, in those early days, I was uh, on the uh, back in the uh, 70s. I was on the, the uh, governor's uh, Florida Panther Council, and uh, I had an organization called Save the Florida Panther. And I was working for the St. Pete Times, and so I went down there with, uh, and I was out with them every day looking for panthers because at the time we didn't have any. We had no, there were signs used to say less than 30 remain as you're driving down the road. And this was a female that they caught. And they decided not. They would tranquilize the cat, and then go up and bring it, bring the cat down and examine it and put a collar on. It. But they decided not to because this, this female was so old. They were worried that she might just drop all the way down and get killed. So they had to walk away from it. But I thought it was, you know, obviously it looks like Florida, you know, it just says Florida Panther. There's another one. They were, they were being, hunting them with dogs that were specially trained only to go after cats, either a bobcat or a, they wouldn't, they wouldn't, they wouldn't bother a deer or anything else. They only went after cats. Boy, you know, they would chase them and they would tree them. That's how they would get catch them. This is uh, James Billy's boat that he had at uh, his house in Fort Lauderdale on the water in the New River there. Bow legs. Later in life, he got both his legs. They were bowed. He got them both, both his knees fixed. <laughs> he's, that's right at the Smallwood store. He's sitting there playing. Back then, in those, in those days when I was with him, he, his salary was 75000 a year being the head of, of this big corporation. Um, nowadays, the, the chairman, the chairmans make uh, almost uh, close to a million dollars a year. The, uh, the dividend for a tribal member back in, uh, in, this, in the 70s, this is Christmas time, he's signing things. The dividend for, the, for them back in the, say, 80s might have been a couple hundred dollars a month for every man, woman, and child. Now it's well over twenty thousand dollars a month. So a man and a woman, wife, three kids, is pulling in a hundred thousand dollars a month. And that changes your your culture, changes everything. Now, at some point, one of the last things he did in, before he got taken out, and uh, again he came back in two thousand ten, and he got taken out in two thousand fifteen. Um, uh, one of the last things he did was he, he changed the, the way they did the, uh, uh, give out the dividend. Children under 18, their dividend was put into escrow. The parents weren't allowed to take it. When the child turned uh, 18, the child had to graduate from school, had to be drug free, and had to uh, pass a uh, financial literacy exam before they could get their money. So I, I don't know if that's still in existence now, but I would assume it would be. Uh, I'm not sure. This was up in, uh, this might have been, uh, not, not sure where that, John Boy Hall in uh, Clueston. John McEwen. John McEwen became a friend of his and actually produced his album, Alligator Tales that uh, was nominated for a Grammy. He also has another album called Seminole Fire that's just legends. Seminole legends. It's sitting at his desk. I've got a bunch of photos of him in a canoe. On it. There was a certain day the light was right and everything. There's out there near Billy Swamp so far that they put people in little chickies that, that stay out there. That was his Christmas card one year. Every year he had to have a different kind of funny Christmas card that had a gator in it in some way. So we. There's another one. See, that's the thing these alligator wrestlers are most proud of is having the gator's mouth open while you're holding them. And, you know, you know. I mean, it's very, very easy for him to switch. You know, that gator to move around and bite his nose off. You know. Here he is. This is at Silver Springs. He opened the show for Willie Nelson. And the place was packed. 
late at night at the desk. That's a big hangar, and then, of course the helicopters. He he did learn to fly a helicopter, and uh, in uh, 2010, he, now of course he's flying. That's a helicopter. He he had a stroke. He was trying to uh, break a horse, uh, <clears throat> and the horse. He used to go out in water. With I've got pictures of him doing this in water. And break the horse in the water. That way, if he got thrown off, he landed in the water. And uh, but this time, the horse landed on top of him. And I guess I guess it caused some kind of a blood clot or something that went up into his his brain. And he they uh, they had rushed him to the rushed him to the hospital. But uh, he lost control of his uh, left arm and uh, his left side. He didn't. He, not, he never bothered. He didn't lose any intelligence or anything. And he never did slur his words, but and after a while, he, he got everything kind of back. But he can't he can't really lift his arm, and he walks walks with a cane. So his days of flying and jumping around playing guitar were, were over with. These are uh, those two little kids. Those little kids today are major stars in Indian country. That's their dad, a Henry uh, a Floyd Kramer style piano player, and. Uh, the, I mean, that's her granddad, and the dad is in the middle there. He's a, a, a Choctaw that married a Seminole. But these two boys made a video called The Storm, and uh, they're both, they both grew up to be really extremely handsome uh, young men, and they're so talented. Um, I, you know, I could have, uh, next time I come, I'll bring their video so you can see the, the video that they did, because it's all, it's all about their own tribe, and, uh, and they filmed it, and, uh, and so. They got the Indian girls swooning all over the country right now. They're in their, their prime right now. Those, those are the, uh, the Batiste, B-A-T-T-I-E-S-T, the Batiste brothers. That's what they call themselves. That's Betty Mae Jumper. <clears throat> I worked directly for her. She, I did one book with her called Legends of the Seminoles. And uh, I still have more of her legends that, I haven't, uh, that I'm going to put out another version of it. But... Um, she was a writer. I mean, she. Whenever we needed something in the, the newspaper, Betty, how about doing a? Can you do a column on Thanksgiving or something? And she go, yeah. She'd go in there longhand on a yellow sheet of paper, come out about 20 minutes later, beginning, middle, and ending. You know, she was just a natural born writer and a storyteller. Yeah, Sword Henry John Billy. Marjorie Stoneman Douglas in an Indian dress that one of the Indians made her. I used to uh, go down and see her down in. Uh, this is the woman, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. Unfortunately, now it's a, it's a tragedy. The name is synonymous with a tragedy, but the Queen of the Everglades. She was probably close to 100 there. She died at the age of 109. But I'll tell you what, right now, I've been to many meetings with her. Um, <clears throat> when she stood up, everyone got quiet. She wasn't afraid of anybody. She'd tell them the way it was. And uh, she was definitely on the side of the environment. She's a great lady. She came from a newspaper, the newspaper family. And um, 109 years old. I, but she always wanted to meet uh, Susie Billy, the Seminole medicine woman. And she always wanted to have a Seminole dress. So I, I got somebody to make her that, that dress. You know, I picked her up one day and took her to a uh, Smallwood store to meet Susie Billy. But uh, Susie was there and just left. And never, she never did get to meet her. But That's her with James Billy in a golf cart. They became great friends and later in life, in the last few things she wrote, she, she wrote about, about the, uh, the Seminoles. You can see the small wood store in the background. She's, you know, one of the greatest Floridians ever. There's no doubt about it. And a woman. She stood up to, uh, you know, the Ever she, she was responsible for Everglades National Park. She was there. She was an adult when Harry Truman came down and dedicated that park. And it was her book, Everglades, The River of Grass. If you haven't read it, get it. Yeah, the small wood store in the background. Huh? That's his daughter, 
Shinutsky, that means the last one. I think he had four after that. <laughs> yeah, that's, that was his horse there, he's saddling up. I hear he's, this guy, this one's, he's trying to break him, I guess. Yeah, there we go. I think he's got a cigar in his mouth. That's what that, I mean, that's what, that, he didn't happen this time, but that's what happened when he, when he had, uh, was injured. Is that picture there? Taking the oath of office with Fred Smith. He and Fred Smith were chairman and president during most of the time that I worked there. Who's the guy in the middle? Yeah, Burt Reynolds. That's uh, <clears throat> Max Osceola. He's still a councilman down there. Burt, James Bill. That's at a restaurant called Burt and Jack's. Which is located at the uh, the Port Port Canaveral, which is in right in Fort Lauderdale there. And there's uh, pictures all over the wall of the famous people that have been there. That's uh, Trey Anastasio, the guitar player, songwriter for Fish, during that concert. That was those. That was the concert ground. They, that was a cattle pasture, and they these guys came in and. Completely made a giant stage and put all that stuff. That was that. Those are actually trailers back there. They, they had they brought in St. Augustine grass, planted flower pots. The band and their parents uh, were all living back there. It was like a little neighborhood with a mailbox and everything. You know, if you they had a, play, a restaurant, they had a pool and they had a tennis court. They made made all that stuff just for this concert. And then they left. A, they left a group of uh, I don't know maybe a hundred fish fans that they paid to stay out there for the next three weeks and they walked through that land and they, they picked up every cigarette but every every uh, piece of litter and their crew came and took out the pool took out the tennis court everything and to this day you, you never know what that happened out there that was the uh, bulletin board at these big rock concerts that's somehow the only way you can find your friends or anything else is you know they couldn't use cell phones out there. None of them worked. I don't, you know. And uh, I tried to get them to get that, grab that thing, and put it in the museum. I thought it'd be a heck of a museum piece, you know. That's Jerry Haney, the chief of the Oklahoma Seminoles. There's about eight thousand Oklahoma Seminoles. Those are the ones that uh, basically, you know, were taken out and had to. That's Bob Butterworth with his enemy, James Billy, there. <clears throat> he was actually a pretty good guy. Uh, and uh, he, he was very, he wanted him to have that, but he didn't want, as sheriff, he didn't want to look like he was promoting bringing gambling in, you know, but he, he, th he thought that they deserved it, you know. He was a, he, he's a South Florida guy, you know, he knew what the Indians were all about. This is a trip we took to uh, Norway. Uh, as that, that one European trip where his band played in all these uh, uh, festivals. And they were being greeted at, on the tarmac there from the tribal plane. I can tell it's a tribal plane. You can see the background. It's got the similar colors on it by a Viking. Miss Seminole. Every year they vote. They elect a Miss Seminole. It's uh, a, you know, you have to have a skill of some kind. You have to write an essay. You have to uh, know a little bit about Seminole culture and uh, and have uh, the political weight, I guess, to get ele to get elected. Uh, you know, but this Miss Seminole and the and the Junior Miss Seminole go everywhere. All year long, every time there's a trip or anything happening, they get to travel with them. They're, all, they're part of the entourage 
it goes with the chief. And they, they have to be good speakers, and, you know, they can't be shy. Anybody recognize her? Catherine Harris, Secretary of State. When we were over there, uh, when we were just leaving uh, Europe, uh, we stayed at, the last stop was, was Paris, and we stayed in a motel, hotel that had the internet on the TV, because we hadn't seen our internet or anything in two weeks. So I got on there, and there was all these horror messages of, uh, where's the chief, where's the chief? From uh, Dale Crider, who was a musician that lives on the New Newman's, Newman's Lake in Gainesville had gone dry. And when it did, all these uh, canoes had popped up to the surface. At the same time, a man in, uh, in the panhandle had gotten a permit to collect deadhead logs, which are logs that fell off during uh, lumber, lumber activities. And they've been underwater very long, but they're extremely hard wood and they're, they're much in demand for banisters and you know, fine wood. You know. and, uh, and this guy uh, had a bulldozer and he was just going across the lake bed picking these things up and Dale was out there trying to get him to stop and so as soon as we got back we, we flew in a helicopter and landed it up there and picked her up called her on the phone because it was it was her person that gave them they signed the permit to let this guy do it and she was shocked and we landed it right on the right on the, the, the bed there she is in the Seminole plane this is during a time when everybody was making fun of her on Fat Saturday Night Live you know but she did right on the spot. She got on the phone and yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yep, that's right. Um, the man on the right is uh, Manuel Lujan, which he was the uh, Secretary of the Interior under Reagan, I believe. And um, I can't think of the other guy's name, but he was the uh, the head of the uh, Department of the Interior's uh, uh, Southern District uh, of Indian in Bureau of Indian Affairs. Lujan uh, started whispering in James Billy's ear at some point. Of course, there was Secret Service there all around us. And he wanted to take a ride in a, in a helicopter. But his staff wouldn't let him do it. So he and James Billy ran to this helicopter and jumped in. And I jumped in right after him and then took off. And these guys, the Secret Service was running and going like this. And, and years later, when I ran into him, he said, that's the greatest thing I ever did in my life was to, get, was to fly over the Everglades with Chief Jim Billy. And a, that's the great Chubby Wise who wrote the Orange Blossom Special, playing with Don Grooms who wrote the song, the Orange Blossom Special, Don't Stop Waldo Anymore. And that's at the Fire on the Swamp that we used to do, music, country music festival every year for about six, seven years out of Big Cypress. That's Patrick Smith, the great author, the great Florida author with Betty Mae Jumper, and that's her book, Legends of the Seminoles. It's, it's out of print now, but you can go on Amazon or any of those sites and find them. That's one of the best books ever yeah. on Florida. Patrick Smith, uh, what's the name of it? Forever, Forever Island. Land Remembered. Land Remembered and Forever, and Forever Island. Read, yeah. Absolutely. His son carried on his legacy. Yeah, his son does a, uh, a program. Uh, yes, yeah, so I've seen it, and uh, he was a uh, he was in the communications department for Virginia College, where I went to college. So that's how I got to know him. But he was a great friend of the Indians, and he he, he consulted with them on everything that he wrote. This is Will McLean, who's considered the patriarch of Florida folk music, in his Indian jacket. He uh, these all the folk music musicians were all friends of, of James Bill, even to this day. That's uh, Waylon Jennings. One of one of one of the elections James Billy won. He, he we hired him to uh, uh, do a congrat you know a, a party for the election you know. So he he's a, he was a nice guy. He uh, sat there and posed with all the Indians and you know. There's there's uh, Trump at the uh, at that dinner I told you about at uh, at the Billy Swamp Safari. The one on the right is Jim Jim Shore the uh, the blind attorney. He was. Graduate of Stetson Law School here in uh, in uh, Pinellas County, but uh, blinded uh, since he was like I think 18 in a car accident, and um, he's the one that got shot by somebody uh, that shot him through his back window, uh, sliding glass door, 
and but it didn't kill him. You know, he, he survived, but somebody was trying to take him out. Never got. They never figured out who it was or anything. Those were all the seminal leaders on one side, and then Donald Trump and his 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 associate and Jim Shore on the other side. That's Mitchell Cypress, the president with the sunglasses on. And this is a, an Indian called Swamp Owl. And there's Trump is one of the people in the background watching this, leaning on the on the railing there. He, he's demonstrating a, a typical Seminole wrestling show. You ever heard of Solomon's Castle out there by Arcadia? Yeah, that's, that's Howard Solomon. And uh, next to him is, uh, uh, I think it's Guy Labrie, the famous uh, artist who just died, uh, I think, uh, a year ago, a year or two ago, who specialized in... Uh, in um, uh, Seminole, Seminole art. He grew up with the Seminoles in Dania, Florida. He he was born in Dania, and of course the Dania Reservation was there at that time. And so he he'd invite the Indians over to his house and uh, they, they, to take showers or to feel air conditioning because you know they were living in, in those days. That, that that area of Hollywood was an Indian reservation with Chickies that they were living in. That's uh, Tom Gaskins, the, the Cypress Knee guy. He used to have a he would, he would search out and find cypress knees that looked like something, like a, like a ballerina's foot or a, 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 a hippo with a Carmen Miranda hat, I think was one of his. He had a whole museum of these things, you know, but um, he died. And I, I'm not sure what happened to that museum. I know it's not there. It was in Palmdale, right on 27. That's Jay Robert, the fiddle player at uh, out of Marco Island with a little Indian girl listening to him. And that's... That's at the Smallwood story also. That's Bobby Henry. He looks the same today uh, as he did back then, and that was probably late 80s or something. He just... I, I got a call a couple years back. I got a call from Joe Madden of the of the uh, Tampa Bay Rays that wondered if, if there was a, uh, a medicine man. Did the Indians have a medicine man? I guess somebody told them about me. And uh, I said, yeah, they got one right here in Tampa. And he wanted to meet him, you know, because the team, his team was the worst team in baseball at the time. And even the star players, they, they were taking the ball out of the glove and going to throw it, and it was going backwards. And was, all these weird things were happening. He felt there was a jinx on the team. So Bobby came, we, he, we came out there one day, and he brought us right into the dressing room with all the players. And we're like, whoa. And Joe's over there cooking breakfast for everybody. It was a day game. And... Um, he, and, and for, so that entire year, from that, it was midway through the season until the end of the season, we had, he, J, Bobby and I had as many tickets as we wanted. We, we took friends and we took Bobby's wife and daughters. And we, right there in the best seats in the house, the Joe Madden seats, you know, and everybody knew us by sight. We didn't have to show any IDs. We walked anywhere we wanted. He would, uh, he would go in there when the team was out of town. We'd walk in there and he'd walk around spring, sprinkling his water on the, on the wall and on the base path. And at some point, he, found, he, he noticed the, uh, you know, these people, these uh, ball, ball players eat those, uh, those seeds, sunflower seeds, whatever they are, and then they spit, they, they spit them out. And Bobby identified that as one of the big problems because those are seeds, they're real seeds. And then they go down into that, that Tropicana field, ast that astroturf, and it, the, the seeds get upset because they, it's, they don't understand what that is, and it, it creates a bad vibe. <laughs> but there's those things are so hard you can't vacuum them up. You know they get guys out there every day and vacuum. So he ordered that they that they get them up. So they had to bring in special hand vacuums that are down there cleaning those things up. And another time he he uh, uh, Grant Balfour was a pitcher for the Rays mm -hmm. and he was wearing a medallion and he every time he threw the ball that medallion would flip up and he would have to put it back in. Bobby said, "Oh no, man, that that that's bad luck. That's that, that's something bad there." That, I need to get on. So I told I told Joe about it. A couple of games later, um, in the middle of the game, we're sitting in our seats, and a guy came to get us. It's like at the seventh inning or something. Joe wants you to see to see you in the locker room, right in the middle of the game. So we go downstairs, we go in the locker room, and the, a guy comes in and he's, he and he's hands us Balfour's medal, his thing that he had around his neck. Bob, Joe wants Bobby to bless this. 
you know, Bobby took it and did his thing, whatever, you know, gave it back to him. I guess Grant put it back on, went in there, and struck out the side. He, they put, he put him in in relief, and he struck out three guys. So That's a Bobby Henry bobblehead there that uh, we had made. And when Joe came back from uh, to, with the Cubs this last time, we saw him on the and we gave him one of those. He has it on his desk. But I've got a couple there if anybody's interested in them. There, but he he blessed a whole bunch of them. He sells them at the at the uh, rainmaker shop, you know, for forty bucks. And I've got a couple here if anybody's interested. But it's good luck, you know. <laughs> this is a, a nighttime dance, Seminole stomp dance. Just the Seminoles there. I think this was at Eckerd College, demonstrating the the, the dances that the, the peculiar dances that the southeastern Indians do, where the women the women just walk like this, and they have shakers that are uh, BBs inside of uh, uh, like uh, coconut husks and that sort of thing to make make a sound, and the men are the ones that sing, and the medicine man does the call, and everybody else does the response. It's, it's very colorful. This is a, a funeral for a, it might have been Jack Knight or some, some famous uh, Tampa guy that helped, them, helped the Seminoles out over the years. And so they, they uh, right before they buried him, they opened the casket and allowed Bobby to minister to him. And put, they put their little lucky things in with his, that was his request. This is in Singapore. A lot, of little, a lot of little kids looked alike, you know. That's a Seminole kid on the right and a Singapore child on the left. That's in Singapore also. That turtle shell. That's Mr. Quek, the richest man in Singapore. He came down to see him, and they actually made a museum right there in the in the middle of Singapore, right downtown, and. Uh, in, uh, in an area that they called the mall or something like that. And, and uh, um, it's up, up there to this day. They actually had Bobby build a, a chiki out of uh, uh, mahogany and whatever, whatever, whatever plants they had growing there, you know. And, uh, he, and Bobby spent every day he would go and sit out there for a couple of hours and he made that uh, totem pole. He's the only, you know, none of the southeastern Indians really have totem poles like they do up north and up out west, but. Whenever he makes one, he always makes one that, that, that looks like himself. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's uh, also in Singapore. Yeah, he's, there he is uh, make, painting the, uh, the totem. Very colorful, and it's. Uh, I, I just feel fortunate that I was able to get pictures like that because they've never let anybody get in the middle of their thing like that. You know, I had guys, I had some medicine people that would never let me take their picture until until years and years later. Susie Billy would never even acknowledge me; she would look away. One day, I, one day I saw her walking all by herself on Snake Road out in the middle of nowhere. She was out looking for. I, I, I didn't know what she was doing, so I stopped. And I said, "Susie, do you need a ride?" She just lifted up her hands and showed me what she had in her hands. They were like a couple sprigs of some kind of uh, herb or something. I took the picture, and that's where that, uh, that's one of the pictures I call the grandmother's hands. This is at, a, at the Gator Bowl in uh, Jacksonville. We had a powwow there, and right before the, uh, it was kind of controversial because a lot of Indians wanted to be in the powwow that weren't real Indians. And the Seminole tribe and the, the organizers of the power would not let any Indian in that didn't have a, a card and Indian, that was with a federally recognized tribe. So all these other Indians went over to Orlando and had their own powwow, a competing powwow. So when we came in the very first day, all the Indians were lined up on both sides and this gigantic fog came in and they were talking about a huge rain was going to come. And I asked Bobby, can you make the rain go away? Because he's famous for making it rain, you know. He says, yeah, and he got, uh, went out there in the middle of the thing. He eventually got a big old knife, a gigantic silver knife, and walked down the middle of that field. And uh, all the Indians were watch watching him. You know, he was murmuring to himself and everything. And eventually, 
it all cleared up and, and it was, became a front and went right over to Orlando and dumped a whole thing on that other power. <laughs> That's a true story. I have no idea what, what happened, how that light, how that came, but I, I thought that was a pretty mystical picture of the medicine man dancing there. That was the oldest man, Buffalo Jim and Susie Billy, the oldest woman at the time I took that. They're both the, were close to 100 years old when that picture was taken at the Smallwood store. <clears throat> this is Susie out in Immokalee. Once I got to know her, she let me go out there. We, at one point, we sat her down. She, she was in the Panther clan, which is the largest of, the, of their clans, and she was the matriarch of it. I, was, I did a, a, a video one time with uh, about the Indians and the Panther that, that I showed at a, at a Florida Panther meeting. And, uh, and she, talked, she talked about the Panther and what it meant and everything. We had her, her grandson was there that interpreted it for us, and it's it pretty cool. When she got when she got so old that she couldn't really go out there and get her own thing, there they had a lady called uh, uh, Alice Snow that lived in uh, uh, Brighton who who grew the medicine that she needed at, at her house and little flower pots all over the place. She was known as a medicine carrier, and I, f I came to find out that that was a common thing in other tribes too. When a medicine person gets sold, they can't get the herbs. Um, they have somebody do it for them, and, and then they contact them somehow and then they bring the herbs that they need to minister a baby that won't start stop crying or somebody that's got a bad pain or arthritis, the different things that they get called in for. <coughs> and then one, one time, uh, Al, and Alice Snow uh, also used to teach a course on Indian medicine at uh, in Naples, at the Naples Botanical Gardens. And that's a beautiful place. When you're on the, that botanical gardens out there, you can't tell that you're in the middle of Naples, one of the most heavily populated growing areas in the country. It's just it's peaceful. They had a lake out there that, that didn't have a name. And this very wealthy man, I uh, can't think of his name now, but he's one of, the, one, of the top, one of the ten most wealthy people in the country from Chicago. He used to see her do that. He would come down there to visit. He saw her do that show, and for some reason he decided he was going to give... The, the botanical gardens, several million dollars, if you know, as a gift, if they would name that lake after Alice Snow. So, so they did, and we went down there. And by this time, Alice was dead, and uh, they named it for her. And uh, there's a plaque there to this day, Lake Alice Snow. Rare smile. See those beads? The Seminole women in the old days especially would have so many beads. It was just unbelievable around their necks. You'll see, I'm sure you've seen pictures of those. Pictures are so rare. I can just can't. I, sometimes I just think how horrible it would have been for all these to be lost. These are just a few of 160,000. Book. Yeah. Well, I've thought about it. Yeah. I, I would like to. Yeah. I think I would do that. Yeah. That's uh, Susie's. Uh, that's. Uh, her granddaughter and great granddaughter. This is when we did that Panther interview, and she's trying to trying to talk, she's trying to explain something. <clears throat> she's teaching the little girl. This kid, if, uh, they have a, the Seminole tribe has a face mask of Osceola. 
uh, that was taken somehow, you know, after he died, I guess. And uh, they have the, in fact, that was one of the things we brought to Singapore. People would line up for half a mile to go walk in a tent and look at that thing. This kid is, looks exactly like that face mask. <laughs> That's why I took that picture. I couldn't believe it. These kids now are like 25, 30 years old. <laughs> Father's up on stage. That's, uh, that's his son on the right and two other kids, his cousins. Bucking the sheep, you know. I think most people never don't even think about them living like this, you know, being living in that kind of uh, traditional way, traditional clothing and everything. Betty May and her uh, great, I guess, great grandson. That, that picture's in that book, The Legends of the Seminole. There's a Dan Osceola, which is Joe Dan, Joe Dan's uh, brother. That's a picture on a children's book somewhere. I, um, I see it every once in a while, um, like a, a book on a little children's book on Seminoles. That's uh, Kawako, James, one of James Billy's uh, children, Kawako. I think these are kids from um, these. Are, these, if I'm not wrong, these are kids from up in uh, the Northwest Territories when we went up there. These are all Bobby Henry's family, the ones that are in this particular frame here. The beautiful patchwork, and they they actually still make that those uh, jackets and shirts and all that stuff. His family is one of the last. Families in, in Tampa, if somebody wanted one, they could order one from them and get an authentic uh, Seminole jacket or dress. This is the Seminole color guard behind the Vietnam veterans. They have, they have a color guard. And this is uh, the grand entry of a powwow parade. And uh, that she's from Canada, the one in the front. The, the one in the red is... Uh, Michelle Thomas, and she's a Seminole. Seminole really don't, they don't have much of a history of, of, in, pow, of in powwows. They weren't the type of Indians that gathered on the hill there and started whooping and hollering so soldiers could see where they were, you know. They, they hid in the swamps, so they didn't, they didn't have a, a loud jumping around type of thing. Like the fancy dancers here. This guy's playing guitar. He, I can't remember his name. These are all Indians from other tribes at those powers. This is uh, Winnebago, Winnebago tribe. I remember that one. And of course, a lot of them have eagle feathers. You know, you can't really have eagle feathers. Nobody else can, but Indians can apply. There's a registry out in Utah or somewhere where you can apply. You know, to get an eagle feather or an eagle carcass or something that you need if it's for a religious reason. If, if it falls on the ground at any time in the power, everything stops. No one moves. And a designated person is there to come out there and pick it up, take it away before the power can stop and start again. That's Gerald Cleveland. He's a, a Winnebago. That's uh, Elvis Keel, a Comanche. He, that's, that's a Comanche ghost dancer. I know you've probably heard of them. This is a picture that's on, on some of these posters. 
it's just right in the middle, right in the middle of the grand entry. I just, I don't know, it just happened to be in the right place. Because really there's no, there's nothing done to it except the picture was taken out and, a, and, a, and a, a put onto a sky. But that's the original picture that came in before that post, those posters were made. Today, the, the Seminole Museum is located on the property that I showed you earlier where James Billy's camp was. But you can still see his old chicky when you're on the boardwalk through the, uh, through the brush back there. There's uh, Brighton, uh, Miss Brighton Seminole. Those are four of the uh, face casts before the, they were bronze. That's the uh, the stairway going up to the second floor of Jim Billy's house out in Big Cypress. <laughs> All the shoes, Susie Billy. That's the fish concert at uh, morning when the sun came up. They went, they started playing. Here comes the sun. They played all night. They started at like eight o'clock in the evening and played all the way till six in the morning. Never left the stage. One at a time. If they had to, you know, go to the bathroom or something, they'd run out and come back. They never stopped the music. That's the big cypress at uh, sunset, I guess, and it's a weird world out there. It looks like the moon. <clears throat> it's all swamp. That they can see the water there, cypress domes, and a lot of oil underneath there too. It's at a council meeting. A lot of times, he had his kids right up there with him at the council meeting. That's it. Questions or anything? Sure. Oh, thank you. Well, they could, but they don't do that. They leave them where they. The only the only difference is that is uh, um, two two or three. My, my last year that I was there, uh, they had uh, we went <clears throat> a, a group of people from the Seminole Museum drove a car a van all the way up to the University of uh, Pennsylvania, and there they have a gigantic collection of Indian skulls. That they had taken off of battlefields, and quite a few of them are southeastern Indians. And the reason they did this is that our government at, at that time, in the in the 1800s, was uh, doing a project uh, which they were they had scientists and, and one scientist in particular I can't think of his name that that were examining these skulls, trying to prove that the brains were a little smaller, trying to prove that the Indians were less than human. As a way of make of justifying going out there and just kill, you know, massacring them day after day after day, and um, you, 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 eugenics. What's it? there's a word for it? Um, starts with an E. But uh, unbelievable. When I started reading about this, I couldn't believe it. So the Seminoles applied. Uh, they wanted the in their own tribe skulls. They wanted to bring them back to the Okeechobee battlefield because that's where they should have stayed. And so they did. They gave them up, you know. And they had the, they they they, they, they gave, put, took a medicine man. They went up there. They 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 uh, got him into little boxes and area like they were supposed to. And then I was not allowed. I, I couldn't. I wasn't allowed to take pictures of the skulls or allowed to take in the grave. They, they built a big old, dug a big old grave, and I couldn't take pictures that showed where it was because of the fear that somebody would recognize it and come and loot it, you know. So, but there, I think they must have been like thirty or forty. Uh, skulls that went into the ground after that. And 
I think other Indians were applying for that also. You know, they couldn't really say no, you know, because the last thing they wanted to have was a fight. Like, well, what do you want them for? Yeah. So that's the only time I've heard of them moving. The, yeah, I, I, I've asked that question. I'm, I'm sure that they, they could, they would have been able to do it, but they, that's not in their culture. That's not what they would do. Well, they have, they have they have the name John is famous too as a last name a last name. It could be. Uh, I mean, they go way way back. It could be uh, they could be related to uh, to slaves. You know, I mean, during the uh, Seminole Wars and everything, they, they a lot of black slaves came into uh, you know Florida. I mean, Florida had a lot of Indian people. Think of Florida as this unpeopled land. And all of a sudden, the Indians came down here. No, there were lots of Indians. All the primitive Indians still had, were still around. The Calusas, the Tequestas, the Arawaks. And all. The, their, their last vestiges were there. They weren't all dead. And uh, so the Seminoles related to all of them as well. They all, they all intermarried. And uh, uh, blacks came down here. Uh, some, people, some people even say that uh, uh, Osceola might have been black. I've, I've, I've heard that rumor. But... Um, and so that you know that name names like because you know the slaves used to be named after their their owners. You know, I'm I'm John. You know, they didn't know what their names were. Oh, thank you. Oh, that's nice. And um, how about we get up, stretch, ask some more questions if you want, have some refreshment, and I appreciate all of you coming this evening. Thank you.